Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webcast, Air Quality and Air Treatment in Compressed Air Systems, sponsored by Kayser Compressors. My name is Travis Hessman. I'm the Senior Content Director and Editor-in-Chief of New Equipment Digest. And before we begin uh, today's show, um, so let me explain how you can participate in the presentation. First, if the slides or audio stop responding, uh, try hitting the F5 key on your keyboard to refresh the webinar console. That will generally resolve most uh, common connection issues like that. Uh, we welcome your questions during today's event. In order to submit your questions to the presenters, simply type it into the uh, Q&A window on the left side of your screen and then hit the Submit button. We'll be answering as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation. And today's session is being recorded and will be available on the newequipment.com website within the next week for you to review. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. On your console, the Kazar logo is uh, hotlinked. Um, if you would like uh, to visit their website during the webcast, you can click the logo um, and a new window will open. That will not take you out of the webinar. Now, I'd like to welcome our presenters. First, we have Michael Camber. He's the Marketing Service Manager for Kaiser. Um, he is KFACT Master Certified and has completed the U.S. Department of Energy's Compressed Air Challenge Level 1 and 2 training. An authority on compressed air, Michael has authored several articles published by the National Press and presented at national technical seminars on compressed air systems. Next, we have Neil Maltreader. He is a certified uh, energy manager and U.S. Department of Energy Air Master Plus qualified. As Kayser's Ener engineering uh, manager, he has conducted and overseen thousands of industrial compressed air studies and helped users achieve significant energy savings and operational improvements. And finally, we have Grazer Atkinson, uh, Kayser's system uh, design supervisor. And he is Master Certified System Specialist and has a degree in Mechanical Engineering from Virginia Commonwealth University. Grayson is responsible for designing systems that follow best practices to meet a wide range of demanding applications in installation challenges. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Michael. Thank you, Travis. So, uh, good afternoon. My name is Michael Camber, and today we're going to discuss compressed air quality and how it impacts operating costs in production system and production. Um, we will also um, present some information about designing the clean air treatment part of your compressed air system for maximum effectiveness while minimizing costs. So uh, here is one way to break out the types of wasted resources in industrial production. These are all areas that plants aim to minimize to some degree, uh, and compressed air quality and the selection of air treatment equipment impact all of these areas. Compressed air is only one facet of plant operations that impacts these areas. Um, and uh, in some plants, it may play only a minor role, but generally, uh, compressed air is mission critical in nearly every plant. It powers more than 70% of all manufacturing activities. And if compressed air is not delivered at the right air quality and quantity, production costs increase uh, as both plant equipment function and product quality can be compromised. A quick sidebar about energy here. Um, compressed air has a high energy cost. And unfortunately, not only is it expensive to create, about 50% of it is wasted on average. Uh, think of it this way, a typical plant has a 50% yield on the compressed air it produces. And if you were talking about your product or, any, you know, any, uh, or the use of uh, raw materials, a 50% yield is really um, abysmal. Um, air treatment decisions have some impact on compressed air energy consumption, and we'll discuss those later on. But the larger energy savings in compressed air are to be found in addressing other issues like leaks, controls, and eliminating inappropriate uses of air. These are not topics for today, but I, I mention it to you to make the point that if you are not looking at the energy cost of your air system, you probably should be. 
All right, so now I'll get back on uh, the main track for today's webinar where uh, we'll discuss ways of ensuring that your compressed air treatment is effective, how it can help reduce scrap and downtime, and energy costs. I'll explain the types of contaminants and touch on air quality standards before turning the mic over to Neil and Grayson to talk about the consequences of design choices, a bit on piping and some tips and best practices. And then we'll have time for some questions. When we talk about air quality, we're aiming to reduce three categories of contaminants down to tolerable levels for the particular application. These categories are particulates, dirt, dust, etc., um, moisture, and oil. And oil is sort of the general term, but that could include any other kind of hydrocarbon. So it could be the compressor fluid, um, or it could be something that's in the air in the uh, plant environment. So um, particulates are solids, and they can be picked up from the ambient air and ingested into the compressor inlet. Uh, for example, cement plants, wood products plants are usually very dusty environments, and the dust will find its way into the compressor inlet. Um, another source of particulate contamination is downstream of the compressor, piping. Uh, rust and scale in iron pipe, for example, may build up over time and then flake off and head down towards the points of use. Neil will discuss this uh, in a little more detail later on. Moisture in both liquid and vapor form is a major problem. Uh, when the compressed air is heated and then cooled, moisture forms in and after the compressor. Depending on ambient humidity and temperature, this can be many gallons an hour. Oils and other hydrocarbon compounds can be in either liquid or vapor form. They can be present in a piston or oil-injected rotary compressor. And it's common for them, um, these, these oils or hydrocarbons, to be ingested from the ambient environment if solvents, spray lubricants, or other volatile compounds are present. This is true whether you're using an oil-injected or oil-free system. Um, also, in rare cases, uh, an oil-free compressor can ingest its own gear oil if the sump vent is too close to the compressor inlet. Again, that's a rare case, but it does, does happen. Um, later, Anil and Grayson will address some economical ways to remove these contaminants. When designing plant air systems, people have different expressions to indicate the overall level of air quality needed. Shop air, plant air, CDA or clean dry air, um, instrument air, uh, these are the common phrases we hear. Um, they're commonly understood, but they're not well defined. Uh, instrument air is a classic example. Uh, often when people hear instrument air, they assume that means a desiccant dryer is required. It's not actually true, um, and uh, we'll see a little bit more of that um, later on. So there, um, uh, in the case of instrument air, there is a, an actual standard, uh, ISA uh, S7.3, that describes instrument air in terms of system design and specifications, but it's still rather broad. It doesn't prescribe specific levels of air quality or the products to treat them. And note that the air quality must meet the requirements of the user in this uh, spec. The burden is on the user to understand and be aware of the requirements needed for their application. This is similar to what's happening uh, in the food industry. There is a set of specifications for compressed air quality. Uh, we're looking here at uh, three, uh, three charts that uh, are part of the ISO 8573 standard that sets classes for specific levels of particulates, water, and oil. Specifying the ISO class level for each contaminant can provide usable guidelines that help you select compressed air dryers and filters. You can take a specific level from each of the three categories to get the ISO class. So for example, ISO class 2.1.1 would be class two for particulates, class one for water, and class one for oil. And then you can select the dryers and filters to meet those conditions. But the reality is most operators don't know the ISO class specifications when designing their air systems. Equipment providers give, uh, usually only give general guidance. They don't specify an ISO class. 
So what's the solution? Well, if you know that a certain combination of dryer and filter models work well for your application, then you can approximate the ISO classes that you're achieving by looking at the specs of those products. Then you basically have your ISO spec that you can use when you expand, replace, or replicate your air system in another plant. If you don't have an existing system to work from, you, you need to use your personal network, your professional network, to find plants with similar processes. And um, often your compressed air equipment vendor uh, has the experience with other customers to know what works for certain types of applications. Um, in short, there are common practices based on experience, but there are plenty of people buying desk and dryers and extra filters because they've been told they're needed or they're just trying to play it safe. Um, and, and that's where some of the ener energy waste um, uh, comes in as well as some um, uh, excess costs uh, in, in your capital equipment buy. Um, so now what I'd like to do is turn things over to Neil Meltreder to get a little deeper into some of the best practices. Neil? Okay, great. Thanks, Michael. <clears throat> I'd like to talk about some common misconceptions when it comes to talking about air quality. These misconceptions may seem innocent enough and really in the spirit of erring on the side of caution. But in reality, it can increase your costs significantly and not provide any additional protection. So air quality is really important. The plant can't tolerate contamination or any downtime. That means we should install any and every dryer and filter just to be safe, right? Let's think about it. U.S. Department of Energy estimates that for a typical industrial facility, 10% of the electricity consumed is for generating compressed air. And for some, it's as high as 30%. So what does this mean in the context of air treatment? Overdesigning or having more components in a compressed air system than are necessary can lead to unnecessarily high electrical costs. This is on top of the extra capital costs and maintenance costs for these same items. Also, pressure drop. Each component adds to the system pressure drop, which means you're going to need to dial up the pressure at the compressors in order to have adequate pressure at the point of use. Keep in mind, every two PSI increase translates to approximately 1% increase in compressor energy consumed. In this way, you're essentially compounding wasted money on electricity. Our next misconception is bigger is better. In practical terms, though, why spend more for something that you don't need? Larger dryers and filters won't remove more of the contaminants and give you better, cleaner quality of air. You'll be spending more money up front on capital for the equipment, spend more every day on electricity, and spend more throughout the life cycle cost or life cycle of the equipment on maintenance. Additionally, you'll lose floor space, which could otherwise be used in more productive ways. The key is to right size your dryers and filters. And you can do this by using correction factors. Correction factors are supplied by the manufacturer, and there are factors for dryers as well as filters. For the sake of sizing, make sure you go with the worst case scenario for your installation, which is probably going to be the summer months. Take the factors for operating temperature, system pressure, and the ambient temperature around the dryer into consideration. Here I have 120 PSI system at 110 degrees Fahrenheit as the operating conditions and 95 degrees for the ambient temperature. Typical dryers are sized for or rated as 100 degree inlet, 100 degree ambient, and 100 PSI inlet. So we've separated these into two charts. The chart on the top is for operating conditions. If we look at 120 PSI, come across to 110 degrees inlet temperature, 
we see a correction factor of 0.83. If we do the same on the ambient temperature at the bottom, we see that at 95 degrees, we're at 1.05. So in effect, what we have is a D rate for the dryer at the higher inlet temperature, but uh, an increase in the rate at the 95 degrees ambient temperature. So what do you do with these two factors? Well, in this case, we multiply them together, and you get 0.8715. You can tell an engineer wrote this PowerPoint here. So what does this mean? It means that in these conditions, the dryer will only have about 87% of its nominal rate of capacity to dry the air to the specified dew point. Okay, so we've figured that out. Next, you take the compressor's rate of capacity, or, and you say, okay, that's 200 CFM in this example that needs to be dried. Then you compare the number we got, which was 174 of the dryer rated capacity with the compressor's rated capacity, which was 200. The dryer should always be higher. In this particular case, it's not. So we should choose the next largest dryer. Otherwise, we could have moisture downstream during a worst case scenario. One word of caution here, you want to definitely be careful about correction factors. They could be either used to multiply against the compressor's flow or divide by the compressor's flow to determine ratings. And that can be pretty tricky. Our next misconception is more is better, meaning more or a higher level of protection. Think of it this way. If your garden has a rabbit problem, you're going to build a fence. Will you spend the extra time, materials, and labor to build a six-foot fence? Or will you go with a three-foot fence, three fence, which is appropriate for that particular job? It's the same with your compressed air system. You want to choose the right components for your particular process. Much like the consequences of our other misconceptions, by over-treating your air, you'll have higher capital costs and spend more on energy and maintenance. And this won't do anything to improve your product quality or reduce your scrap rate when compared to using the right selection of equipment for your application. Here's a common example of over-treating going with a desk and dryer when only a refrigerated dryer is needed. Refrigerated dryers are capable of handling the vast majority of applications. We estimate probably about 90-95%. They cost less to buy and to operate when compared to a desk and dryer. Remember, the instrument air, uh, quality air specification Michael mentioned before, pressure dew point 18 degree below minimum temperature. Desiccant dryers use purge air to recharge the desiccant bed, so you're losing compressed air to this operation. They can get uh, air um, um, temperatures or dew points down to zero degrees Fahrenheit, minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, or minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's significantly lower than a refrigerated dryer. Plus, the desiccant will need to be replaced as a normal maintenance item, which can be expensive and they are only really necessary for moisture-sensitive processes, like with some electronics, medical, or pharmaceutical applications. They are also appropriate when any part of the compressed air distribution is exposed to freezing temperatures. However, during warmer months, switching to a refrigerated dryer or a Hybritech dryer, which includes a desiccant and a refridge dryer, can have a very reasonable return on investment. So these are things that you can do uh, to consider um, offsetting costs or also what, what air quality is really required. Our last misconception has to do with the type of compressor selected. Typically, oil is bad. I need oil free, uh, an oil-free compressor. But just because you have an oil-free compressor, uh, like Michael mentioned before, that doesn't automatically guarantee you have oil-free air. You still need to have adequate filtration. What does it mean to have an oil-free compressor? It doesn't mean there's no oil in the compressor. It means the oil doesn't come in contact with the airstream in normal operation. Keep in mind 
whatever is in the ambient air will still be ingested into, into the compressor inlet and flow through the compressor. Filtration and drying are still necessary for clean, dry air and oil-free systems. Also consider that oil-free compressors are usually less efficient than oil-injected units, and they cost more upfront and have higher maintenance costs. That's not to say they're a bad choice. They should just be properly applied. Examples of some possible appropriate applications would be pharmaceutical, electronics, as well as chemical. A final point, and this is true for systems with oil-free or oil-injected compressors, is don't forget the piping. Uh, I've seen this almost every facility that we walk into uh, where plants spend time and energy selecting, purchasing, and installing a bevy of compressed air treatment even perhaps replacing uh, equipment entirely, um, only to have the clean, dry air pass into old, dirty pipes. Some piping materials are a source of contamination that can flake off and migrate to the production equipment. If you need clean, dry air, I suggest copper or aluminum. Stainless steel is also an excellent choice, but it's going to be much more expensive, and it's typically only required for special applications. Whenever possible, piping should be sized and looped to reduce overall air velocity and pressure drop. There's that key word again, pressure drop. Uh, you're paying, again, um, for every 2 PSI drop, a, a 1% uh, uh, reduction in overall energy costs or, or an increase, uh, depending on how you look at that. If it's a 2, a 2 PSI increase, it's a 1% increase in energy cost. So sizing the piping with the future in mind, I, I can't stress that enough, so I'll say it again. Size your piping with the future in mind. Otherwise, when you expand and you add more compressed air to the system, the increased pressure drop can significantly affect your scrap rates. Okay, and with that, I'd like to hand it off to Grayson Atkinson, who will finish out our webinar. Thank you, Neil. Hello, everyone. I'm Grayson Atkinson, and I'm Kayser System Design Supervisor. Uh, during this portion of the presentation, I'd like to focus on individual air treatment components and how they work together in a system. And then we'll end with some system design best practices tips. The graphic above shows the air treatment included in a typical compressed air system. And uh, as we progress, we'll go through each part in a little bit more detail. The first air treatment element in our system is the moisture separator. So as you can see in the graphic above, I've highlighted the compressor um, to represent the moisture separator. This is because many compressors come with the moisture separator directly integrated into the package. If you have a compressor without one, like for example a reciprocating compressor or a piston compressor, uh, then you'll want to install one near the compressor discharge. Next we have an air receiver tank. I'm often asked where to install a receiver tank and it honestly depends <coughs> on what your goals are. In the setup here we have a wet tank and this is installed after the compressor and before the air treatment. Its main function is to knock out the initial slug of water to help air treatment after the tank function more effectively. You want to make sure you have a functioning drain on the tank and that you regularly check that it's operating correctly. This type of tank should be sized as one to three gallons of storage for every CFM in your system. The other option is to use the air receiver as a dry tank. This is installed after the air treatment and it creates storage to handle intermittent high demand events. In order for there to be storage, the pressure must be higher than the operating pressure requirement at the point of use. These tanks are typically sized at 3 to 5 gallons per CFM. In a perfect world, systems would have both a wet and a dry tank. However, this is not typically possible due to floor space restrictions. If that's the case for you as well, decide which is more of a priority, either moisture control or storage. Next, we have drains. These should be installed on receiver tanks, filters, and dryers. There are three basic types of drains, manual drains, timed electric drains, and demand drains. Manual drains are exactly what they sound like. They're simply a hand-operated valve, and they're only reliable as the person responsible for checking them. They're inexpensive, but not really the best choice for consistent and reliable moisture protection. Timed electric drains are set on a timer to discharge. This makes them a bit more reliable, however, they will always open when the timer goes off, even when there's no moisture present in the system. Also, it's important to adjust the timers for the season. They would need to open more often during the summer than the winter. 
Timer adjustment must be done manually, so that's also easy to miss. The best option would be a demand-operated drain. This type of drain is a bit more expensive, however, it only discharges when moisture is present, so compressed air isn't wasted. Also, some drains have additional contacts that can be connected to system master controls or to plant controls that would signal when there is an alarm. This is especially helpful for applications that cannot tolerate any moisture. A final note on drains with respect to tanks. Lack of an effective drain has several bad effects. In addition to moisture migrating downstream, you reduce your air storage volume and run the compressors less efficiently. They'll short cycle and increase wear and maintenance required on cycling components. Without reliable drains on moisture separators, tanks, dryers and filters, you run a high risk of contaminants, which you're already spending money to remove, building up in these components and getting downstream into your production equipment. With tanks, there are other negative impacts. Moisture can build up quickly in the tank, particularly during summer months. The more water, the less room for storage. The less storage, the more your compressor will cycle on and off. As we said earlier, this uh, increased wear, stress on valves, motor starters, air ends, and coolers. The results, more frequent maintenance, more frequent repair, and greater downtime. There's also shorter machine life to worry about and an elevated energy cost. Shown here is a refrigerated dryer, but another common option is a desiccant dryer. There are other dryers available as an integrated option in a rotary screw compressor as well. Those are typically refrigerated dryers, and they're installed in a cabinet that's attached to the compressor package. Standalone dryers, regardless of their type, would be placed in the same spot in a system. From a system design point of view, the difference is in which filters are necessary to include with the dryer type and where those filters need to be installed, either before or after the dryer. So as Michael mentioned earlier, there are different types of filters that remove different types of contaminants. Contaminants include oil, moisture, and particulate. If you have a desiccant dryer, it will need to have additional filtration before and after the dryer. Install a particulate and an oil coalescing filter before the dryer. This is because desiccant beds are highly sensitive to oil, and the desiccant will not be able to absorb moisture properly if even trace amounts of oil are present. After the dryer, be sure to include a particulate filter. This will catch any of the dust or desiccant finds. If you're worried about odor and taste, you also want to consider adding an oil vapor filter. All of the moisture or condensate from a system needs to be disposed of. It cannot simply be drained into a sewer system. Having a condensate collection system like the one shown here will help you make sure you're following environmental regulations. The type of container shown here is connected to all of the drains, tanks, compressors, filters, and dryers in the system. It has a filter which then removes the contaminants to a level safe for disposal. Make sure you consult your local code for guidance on disposal regulations as that will vary from area to area. The final component in our air treatment lineup is the air main charging valve. This valve essentially provides a controlled pressurization during startup to prevent high velocity air from overrunning air treatment components. It's useful for systems that are shut down and restarted regularly. For example, systems that run single or double shifts. It's also useful for systems that have a high air quality standard but run 24-7. Now that we've discussed the individual components, I'd like to close with a few best practices tips. Tip number one is to think of your compressed air system in terms of zones. Break down the points of use and determine what each of them needs in terms of pressure and air treatment. If you have a specific section that needs higher quality air, consider adding additional filtration near that application. The same is true for pressure. It's much cheaper to treat an application instead of the entire system. Our second tip is to think about controls when selecting a specific dryer model. Two common types of control are energy management and non-energy management. Energy management dryers match energy consumption to demand and are best applied when a system runs continuously and has varying demand loads. These are available in both refrigerated dryers and desiccant dryers. A non-energy management type of dryer could be programmed for on-off times to meet specific shift requirements. 
This will give energy saving operation for systems that have consistent demand that is close to the dryer capacity. And our last best practice tip is to think about communication capability. With the industry moving more and more towards IoT solutions, start planning now and be ready to integrate components and systems. Look for capabilities on dryers that enable communicating with air master controls and SCADA systems. Having the connection to a centralized system can enable alarm notification for when there is a dryer or drain alarm. When necessary, it can also be programmed to shut the system down in order to prevent contamination due to an air treatment malfunction. This can help protect products and reduce scrap. So in closing, there's a lot to keep in mind when determining the right air treatment components for a compressed air system. Careful planning, though, can significantly reduce life cycle costs, improve uptime, and reduce product scrap. Don't be afraid to work with a compressed air expert to properly select the right air treatment solutions for your application. I believe we have time for a few questions, so I'll hand things back over to Travis. Hey, thanks a lot. Um, that, was, uh, that was excellent, guys. Um, and we are going to move uh, straight into the Q&A um, session now. Um, a few of you uh, have already sent in some uh, good questions, uh, and we have plenty of time for a very hearty discussion on each. So please keep the questions rolling in. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, while our presenters are answering those questions, uh, I would ask that you just take a moment to uh, complete the feedback form um, that should be appearing on the left side of your screen. All right, um, so let's jump right into this. Um, we have a, a really interesting question that popped up um, right up top. Um, um, and uh, I guess you guys can uh, sort out uh, who's most qualified to answer. Um, let's see. Uh, would it be a good idea to install a cycling dryer in a series after a primary non-cycling refrigerated dryer? Um, for clarification, they add, um, so if the cycling secondary dryer perceives wet air, it kicks in and dries the air. If the primary uh, primary dryer is doing its job properly, then the cycling dryer does nothing and just waits to save the day from a wet air event. All right, Travis, this is Neil. I'll uh, be happy to answer this one. It's a good question. Uh, I've seen it before in facilities. Uh, the question really has to do with um, for, for me, more of a redundancy. Um, so the issue uh, would be, um, <clears throat> you know, for me, if I was going to be putting two dryers in series, it would be um, if my first dryer failed, then I would have another dryer as secondary available to go in case of emergency. Um, and I've seen it done in the past. It, it also gets to uh, kind of my slides uh, where we talked about, say, uh, oversizing or over-treating. Um, in this case, what, what you could do um, is, is have two dryers, uh, which would both be cycling, uh, which would be, let's say, a little bit more money, but they would both be 100% uh, duty cycle for the system. Uh, so let's say the system was 1,000 CFM. Both dryers would be set for 1,000 CFM, depending on, like we talked about, worst-case scenario. Um, so they would be uh, available to go. Um, if you had two cycling dryers, uh, if the demand was 50% uh, and the piping was sized such that the flow would be split, then you would have 250 CFM go into one dryer, 250 CFM go into another dryer, um, in which case you would only pay to treat the compressed air as needed and hit your required dew point. Now the question then would be, well, what if I had one dryer fail? Now I've got air going past one dryer that's not treated. Uh, Grayson mentioned uh, an air main charging valve. If the air main charging valve was tied into a dryer failure alarm <clears throat> or a, a moisture content alarm, let's say, uh, from a drain, you could shut that valve completely off in that line, then all the air would go into that second dryer, which would be sized for a 100% duty cycle. So for many of our customers, that's how we're sizing things. Um, to get back to the question at hand, which was, can I put two dryers in series, one, a non-cycling, and, and two, uh, the second one being a cycling dryer? You can certainly do that. <clears throat> and for some customers, that gives them the peace of mind and um, allows them to avoid, per se, uh, water downstream uh, affecting scrap rates and production. Um, what that does is, in effect, um, cost the system more. Um, and truth be told, what happens if, 
the secondary dryer fails, then you're, you're spending the same amount of money for the primary dryer um, from an energy cost standpoint. So, you know, it, like I said, we've seen it done in, in the past. Uh, it certainly could be done. Uh, if you were to ask uh, my personal or professional opinion on it, uh, I would probably go with the two dryers like-sized, both cycling um, with the air main charging uh, valve to tie in to the alarm signals to close one uh, of the dryers. Uh, that way um, you can assure, number one, that you're not paying more uh, to treat the air, and then two, you have that security from an air quality standpoint. So thanks for the question. Good question. Well, thank you very much. Um, here's another one. Um, really fascinating questions coming in. I, I'm, I'm liking it. Um, uh, so this one um, is uh, goes to some length. Um, would you ever consider a, a single compressor system for mixed processes, like um, producing air to run tools with air to fill breathing systems, like for firefighting? And they add, uh, ships have limited space, and the breathing system compressors always seem to be shoved into a space as an afterthought, and most ships have a lot of capacity for processes. Okay. Um, yeah, interesting question. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll try and answer that. So, um, uh, yes, sometimes people will, out of necessity, feed um, multiple processes with a single compressor. What you have to be um, uh, careful of is what pressures are required. So, um, sometimes um, uh, if you're, some equipment may require much higher pressure than another, and it can be, um, uh, you can have separate pressure zones if the pressure differential is not too high. So, for example, if you were, uh, I think uh, they were talking about some um, um, firefighting uh, equipment, sometimes, uh, like, uh, filling those, if you're filling tanks, um, like uh, breathing tanks, sometimes that requires thousands of pounds. I mean, a compressor that puts out thousands of PSI. It's probably not terribly effective to then try and regulate that um, and in small volumes, uh, typically. So it's, it's not efficient to try and have a, uh, regulate part of that compressor's uh, production down to plant air, tool air to 100 pounds in another part. That's too big of a differential. If you had one area of, of a, an operation that needed 125 and then you wanted to regulate an area, a wing of the, uh, the operation down to, you know, 90 pounds, that's, that's not a problem. You can use flow controllers and accurate um, uh, pressure reducing valves to do that. Um, so that's, that's one consideration. What is the pressure differential between those things? The other thing about um, using a single um, compressor is you just don't have backup. That's just a, a fact of life. So I hope I've, I've answered that question. Yeah, I um, hope so. That was a, it was a, that was a really, uh, really interesting question. Um, let's jump off um, to uh, uh, perhaps a, a more straightforward one um, before we get into um, some other media ones like that. Um, so if you have a single ta tank system, um, should you go with uh, wet or dry? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really good question. And ultimately, it comes down to what your priority is as far as um, your production and, and what you're using the compressed air for. Um, the wet tank, the main goal for it is to take out the initial hit of water that's coming out of the compressor and sort of separate that from the air. Um, and protect the downstream equipment from being hit with huge slugs of water. Um, so if, if that's your priority, then I'd say wet storage. Um, the dry tank, the tank located after all of your air treatment equipment, um, that's typically a larger tank, and it's used more to, I'd say, ride out high intermittent demands and to help your compressor uh, to cycle effectively. If you, you don't have enough storage in the system, your compressor is going to load, unload, load, unload, load, unload uh, very rapidly, and that can increase your, your wear on your maintenance parts and your internals to the unit. Um, so it, it's really more of what you want the storage to accomplish if you can only pick one of the two. Hopefully that answers right. the Thank question. You. Sure. Yeah, that was good. Um, okay. Um, Jump onto this one. Um, 
So um, on factoring in uh, future expansions, what things um, should, uh, should people consider apart from expecting scaling of production and the type of process? Yeah, so, um, so this is Neil. When I uh, went over uh, considering expansion, I was talking specifically about piping. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question for piping, and then we'll talk a little bit um, about everything else. Um, in regard to piping, you know, when, when you're looking at a system and you say, okay, it's a 500 CFM system, I'm looking at the overall pressure drop based on a chart, and I say for 500 feet, that pressure drop might be 2 or 3 PSI. That's a great choice when we look at what, how much pressure drop you should see in piping over, over the course of the system from, the, say, the compressor room to the point of use. It's 10%. So if it's a 100 PSI system and we say 10%, that's 10 PSI. But, you know, keep in mind that those systems may change over time. So for the example I use, 500 CFM, maybe 2 inches is great. But if you put in 1,000 CFM and you double that, 2 inch is probably too small to meet that 10% guideline. So you want to look at those charts, um, which are available via KGI or a lot of manufacturers have them as well, um, or Compressed Air Challenge. And that will show you what the different pressure drop is. Uh, many uh, providers out there who sell piping, aluminum piping, copper, can also do the calculations for you. So when, when you're looking at expansion, you want to look at, okay, how big of a facility do I have today? Um, what am I looking at doing tomorrow? Or, you know, from a, a sales perspective or a product perspective, um, am I looking at process improvements? And what's going to happen with this facility three, four, five years down the line? Um, obviously, from uh, um, a provider standpoint, you want to see your system expand or, or uh, investment be made. So the other thing you want to think about, too, is what's going to happen in the compressor room. So if you buy a 500 CFM compressor today, um, do you have room for another 500 CFM compressor tomorrow? Is that going to fit in the same space? Do you have room for that additional dryer? Um, do you have a room for an additional receiver? Um, is there enough ventilation in that particular room? So those are things that you also want to consider, um, and then you want to consider how those compressors will work together. Uh, Grayson mentioned uh, the uh, IoT, um, uh, and so, you know, is this an opportunity for us to put in a master control? Michael said something that was really poignant to me in regard to if you don't know what the cost of your compressed air system is, you should. So that's kind of where... You know, when you're looking at future expansion, you want to see what you're doing today, how efficient you are, what's your pressure drop over the system, what's going to happen tomorrow. Is it going to be 20, 30, 40 percent expansion? Do you have enough capacity? A master controller can tell you all those things, uh, so that's a great way for you to have an idea on what to do for your future expansions. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, all right, we have a new one about um, equipment. Um, when is the use of pressure or flow controller appropriate? So um, I'll uh, I'll jump on that. And um, so a flow controller uh, can be um, very useful um, when you have two different uh, zones requiring different pressures in, in a plant, um, and you can. Um, um, so if you basically have one, you know, one production line or one process that needs uh, lower pressure, and you don't want to have a, a dedicated compressor for that, uh, which you know in, um, adds additional expense um, and so forth. So that's one um, uh, one option. Again, you have to pay attention to that pressure differential so that you're not compressing air at a much higher pressure, which is inherently energy intensive. Um, uh, because remember what Neil said, every, every, basically every pound that you increase pressure, in, uh, every two pounds you increase pressure increases the energy input um, a percent. And that's really at plant air levels. When you start talking about some, you know, if you need a 200 pounds somewhere or 300 pounds somewhere and you only need 90 pounds somewhere else, that's kind of a different ballgame. Um, the other um, um, thing, uh, the other application for a, a flow control is um, if you are, if you don't have a good a control, if let's say you have multiple compressors and you don't have a good 
a way to control them all, um, or you or your piping distribution is uh, is not uh, terrific. You can overcome some of those design um, uh, inefficiencies in an older plant. Typically, this is an existing plant um, where you may not have the capital budget to really go in and, and do a, a an audit and figure out what the best mix of compressors is and, and resize everything. But you can do a flow control. Um, you can increase the pressure, increase the storage volume, and, um, um, and then use a flow control to um, uh, very accurately meter out um, the air demanded. And that can decrease your compressed air energy costs uh, and, and deliver very stable air pressure to the points of use. Um, if you um, again, I'll emphasize that's in an existing plant. If you don't have the ability to really um, um, evaluate the entire system and, and, and have the capital budget to say, you know what, what we really need to do is resize the, you know, the compressors and, have, and, um, and the controls, because you can really get very stable pressure um, using multiple compressors and a good um, electronic controller versus a pressure control. Okay, I hope I've... Anything to add on that, Neil? Or um, and you may have answered this, but um, one, one thing that you see with high inter intermittent demand events is mm. big storage and a flow control. So, um, you know, what Michael was talking about where you have, let's say, maybe older machines and they don't play well with each other, um, and that, that works great with a flow controller. It also works great when you have three, four, five, six machines and you need big air, um, maybe you augment the storage twice as much as what you had before and you're able to meter out the air that's required so you're filling the storage with these three, four, five, six machines and maybe you only need two or three to run. Mm -hmm. And then you can avoid that demand charge by bringing in compressors four, five, and six for that big intermittent demand event. So you've added storage, you've added that flow controller, and now you've turned machines off and kept them off. That um, can make a big difference on your bottom line. Um, and, you know, it, it's not every system, but it, it, there's certainly quite a few big air users uh, that could benefit from uh, flow control. Right. And one of the big benefits is if you have leaks, and ch chances are extremely high that you do, y if you use a flow controller to reduce the, um, the demand side air pressure, you're going to reduce the amount of, en of air lost to those leaks, and you're going to reduce your energy cost that way. So if you've got leaks and artificial demand, you're going to be, or inappropriate uses, you're going to be feeding them at a lower pressure, saving energy. Uh, the one thing to note, though, is you do actually have to create, you know, a, this storage buffer by actually running the compressors at a higher pressure level than you need in the plant. So if you need 90 pounds, in the plant, you might have to bump up the pressure on the compressors to 125, and so you have that, basically you're sort of, you know, uh, if you want to, you're damming up the water, you know, the water in the, in the dam. You're, you're basically storing up a large buffer of higher pressure air and metering it out. So there is, there is that little bit of a uh, concern about you have to run the compressors at a higher pressure, which does cost you some energy, but the idea is you, you gain on the, on the uh, demand side by lower leak rates, lower artificial demand, and so forth. Yeah, and, and the last point I think I'd make on it is um, when you're controlling pressure, um, if you would, you're controlling the flow, the flow controller is going to open and close based on whatever the downstream pressure is, and they can hit really solid targets, plus or minus 5 PSI, maybe even lower. Um, so that's fantastic. Uh, but... What it doesn't do is it doesn't control what's happening in the compressor room. So, you know, if like I talked about those three, four, five, six machines, how do they know they should be off? Uh, they, well, I'm, I'm the operator. I make sure that they're all on so they're all going to run. Well, if you don't have a master controller to sense that pressure and say, okay, one, two, and three, you guys run, and four, five, and six, you stay off, and then it can rotate those machines as needed uh, and, and keep them off. So... That's the other point of clarification that I'd, I'd really like to make is that just because you put in a flow controller doesn't mean that your system is going to run more efficiently. It means, like Michael said, you're going to have lower leak rates, lower artificial demands. There's going to be energy savings, but it doesn't mean that you're going to be running any more efficiently than you were before. So 
Um, it, contr it controls your demand better, but not your supply. Right. That's the and that's in effect what you're paying for, yep. paying the most for. Yep. Yeah, that was incredible. Thank you, guys. Um, uh, good. Um, all right. So let's jump over to uh, a process question. Um, or a, a, a fixing question. Um, what do what do I do if I'm getting uh, water downstream? Uh, I mean, I think we'll probably tag team on this too. I mean, there are a number of things you want to look at. So first of all, you want to look at the the dryer. Um, if it's a if it's a, a temporary problem, um, it could be that the uh, the ambient conditions are such that the dryer isn't sized for the load. So if it happens more in the summertime, for example, it could be the excess heat and humidity um, are just making the dryers in size for that load, okay? Um, and that's where those correction factors come in. Um, if it's a more permanent problem, then you want to look at the dryer, the condition of the dryer. Is it charged with refrigerant? Um, is, it, uh, is the condenser clean? So is the dryer operating properly? Uh, if so, other things you want to look at, make sure your drains on your tank and your dryer and your filters are operating because if a drain doesn't work, you can dry the air and, and use a tank to, you know, to capture moisture, um, but if it doesn't have somewhere to go through that drain, it's just going to back up and go downstream. Even And a dryer won't stop liquid water from going through it. Um, it will just make it a little cooler. Um, anything to add to that? Um, you know, the other thing you want to look at, too, is um, how your condensate management system is set up. You know, you, you have drains on filters, tanks. You may even have it inside the compressor, like Grayson said, and the moisture separator. Um, but then you've got a uh, hard pipe or tubing that's going to then go to either directly to the condensate management system or to a header. So in a lot of cases, there's shared lines. Um, so you could have one drain feeding into another drain, feeding into another drain, and then trying to go uphill and over dale and so on and so forth to try to get to this condensate management system, and it never gets there. So, you know, what, what you want to make sure is that you're only single tracking uh, your drains, meaning it's, it's coming up and it's going either directly into the condensate management system or it's going into a header. Um, each of your drains should have basically a, a, a height limit as to how high it can push the water, so don't exceed that. Um, and really, it's, it's a best practice to hit a main header and then have that header slope downwards uh, into uh, the condensate uh, manifold. So, um, and, and also to, uh, to make sure that you regularly uh, PM that condensate manifold um, so that, uh, or the condensate management system so that you don't run into any issues with that. Great, thank you. Um, and now a, a compatibility question. Um, can uh, Kaiser air treatment components work for, uh, with any other manufacturer's air compressor system? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, and just like Michael said, I mean, you know, it has to do with correction factors as well. Um, but really, a, a dryer is a dryer. So um, you know, as long as you're considering uh, the main components, which is what's the rated flow, what's the rated pressure, and what are the operating temperatures and ambient conditions, um, you know, it, compatibility is, is really no issue. Right, and the same is true for filters. It's, you know, are you, um, as long as you're picking the right type of filter for the right type of contaminant, uh, an oil, a coalescing oil filter or a vapor filter, or, you know, it depends on what you want to use, but yes, you can, if you have existing components from one brand and they're functional and they work, you know, and they're good quality. No need to, you know, if you're, but you're adding a new, you know, another component of a different color, a different brand, no need to get rid of what's working. Excellent. Good. Thank you very much. Um, and now uh, process again. Um, can, can I slow down compressors cycling by adding tank capacity? Yeah, so the, the short answer to that is, is yes as well. Um, it, it really depends on what type of storage you're adding. Uh, like we talked about the, the purpose of the wet tank and the dry tank earlier, um, but the, the compressor loading and unloading and cycling um, is directly related, related to the amount of storage in a system. 
Um, the bigger the storage volume you have and the larger the band between the load and the unload point that in the compressor setting, um, the longer that compressor is going to run to go from its load pressure to its unload pressure, and then ideally the longer the amount of time it's going to take for the demand to bleed that storage volume down from its unload pressure to its load pressure again and repeat the process iteratively. So the more storage you have, the longer the compressor is going to run, and then the longer it's going to be shut off between those cycles. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, now, um, how important is uh, room temperature uh, in regards to air quality? Um, uh, I'll take this one. So room temperature uh, is very important, um, it's especially if uh, you're using a refrigerated dryer. So um, room, you know, the room temperature for the compressor, uh, where the compressor is and where the dryer is, impacts um, one what the temperature of the compressed air is. Uh, so the hotter the room temperature, the higher the temperature of the compressed air coming out. The higher that temperature, the less moisture you're going to condense in the compressor's after cooler. Okay, and that's the first step in moisture separation. The, you, when you cool that air in the after cooler of the compressor, you're taking a lot, not all, but a lot of the moisture putting into a liquid form where the tank or a moisture, a liquid separator can, can take care of it. Um, so the hotter it is in the compressor room, um, the less moisture you'll get out at that point. Likewise, um, for the dryer. If the dryer is uh, sized properly uh, for that higher temperature, no problem. But if the temperature, if the, um, the, the, and the standard um, ambient condition, the, uh, for the, the dryer's nominal rating is typically 100 degrees ambient, 100 degrees um, uh, Fahrenheit for the compressed air temperature, and um, 100 pounds of pressure. So if the inlet temperature of the compressed air is higher than 100, the dryer won't work as effectively. If the ambient temperature around the dryer is higher than 100, it won't um, work as effectively. If you oversize the dryer, you can counteract that, and that's what the correction factors are for. I, th I think that uh, gets to that question. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for a couple of more, um, if, you're, uh, if your voice is a holdout. Um, okay. Uh, what is your opinion on incorporating dew point control-based uh, selection for refrigerant versus desiccant uh, dryer in a system? I think it's a great question, and, and it's something that we didn't talk specifically about, just because we were talking about the macroscopic, this is really more of a microscopic, but it can, it can save a very good amount of money for you. Um, and, and it has to do with, um, like we talked about earlier, the cycling dryer versus really the fixed demand dryer in regard to a refridge dryer system. Um, heatless dryer, desiccant dryer, there's, there's also heated dryers, uh, heated desiccant dryers. Um, both of the, the, those types, heatless and um, uh, the uh, heated uh, desiccant dryers have options in regard to purge savers, uh, and I would refer to them as, you know, dew point control uh, as well, and, and these are going to be great because you're going to have a lot less energy consumption, specifically on the heated dryers and, the, and, and let's say, a blower purge desiccant dryer. So if I were to buy a, a blower purge or a heated desiccant dryer for my facility, I would have to have dew point control. Um, typically, they're a little bit more expensive uh, than the standard option, but without it, you're not going to get any energy savings. And, you know, consider this, you know, usually when you look at a blower purge or a desk and dryer or a heated desk and dryer versus a heatless dryer, um, heatless dryer is going to have 15, 18% of the rated capacity as purge air. So that means you have to oversize your system to meet that demand. Um, that's a lot of air. So most people would say, well, how can I avoid that? And the, the avoidance topic would be if I need desiccant quality air, I need a heated dryer or a heated blower purge dryer. But, you know, how do you make sure that it runs effectively? So if you add dew point control, then you can make sure that only the needed amount of uh, dew point is hit and you're not trying to dry 3,000 CFM when you only have 1,000 CFM going in. So Dew point control is, is a great option, and I, I would definitely recommend it, uh, specifically on um, a desiccant quality air uh, for, uh, 
for refrigerated uh, quality air, you know, most typical systems, uh, cycling dryer uh, would be enough uh, to really match part load uh, to the demand. Okay. Um, well, thank you. Um, and I'll tell you, what, that takes us almost exactly to the top of the hour, so that was uh, extremely well-timed. So thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Um, Michael Camber, uh, Neil Meltretter, um, Grayson Atkinson, that was an excellent presentation. And of course, our sponsor, uh, Kaiser Compressors. And as a reminder um, for you, all of you out there, if you are registered as a group, please add uh, the names and emails of all in attendance on the exit survey. And with that, on behalf of New Equipment Digest, we wish you out there um, a productive remainder of your day, and thank you very much for joining us.